Well, many people have been using the 23andMe DNA kit to learn more about themselves, their family's history as well. But one woman found out some disturbing information that has resulted in a lawsuit. Roberta Voss used the kit, discovered that her biological father is a retired doctor who used his own sperm in her mother's infertility treatments back in 1983. Joining us now to discuss Hunter Skolnick, an attorney who's represented plaintiffs in cases similar to Rebecca Voss. We're going to bring in our panelists for today as well. Jack Kingston, former Georgia congressman. Also Jennifer Kearns, host of the All-American Radio and a contributor for the Daily Caller in the Hill. She's also a Newsmax insider here. Okay, great to see our panelists here and Hunter as well. Bring us up to speed on this case. Uh, how common do we see cases like these and what has she done to take action? Well, first of all, unfortunately, we are seeing way too many, too many of these stories pop up. 23andMe is a, supposed to be a, a, a good thing. Let's find out who our ancestors are. But then to wake up one morning and find out your mom's doctor used his own sperm to impregnate her um, and, and living this lie and finding it out um, is, is, is just outrageous. Um, the, the Voss family woke up one day, and, and that's what they found out, and they filed suit. Um, and we're seeing these lawsuits coming up across the country. Yeah, what, in this case, what does justice look like for these doctors? I'm assuming their medical license would be taken away. That would be the end goal here? Well, think about it. That uh, You wish that would be the end goal. And, and this doctor was sanctioned for something, but it is not going to be the end goal of this case. This doctor is long retired, living in, in the, the relaxing life down in, down in Southern Florida, um, retired as I understand it. Um, and, and he probably will have no, um, no uh, repercussions from this. He has a lawsuit. He had, probably has insurance coverage. And, and this is a, sort of a, a, you know, a, a, a fly buzzing around his head from his perspective while he's ruined a, a family's life. Yeah, and you say you've had clients who've made this this discovery about their family members as well. Uh, what does that do to them once they come to this understanding uh, that their the sperm donor uh, had taken advantage of their own mother? Well, the the situation that I had, the case that I, I dealt with, really turned out to be tragic. It ended up becoming a battle between a mother and a daughter. The daughter's life was ruined from her perspective. The mom wanted to put it behind her and make like it never happened. And they could not proceed with a lawsuit without the cooperation of the mother. There, there are so many ramifications of this. Does, does the mom who's in her 60s, 70s, 80s want to relive this and try to explain it in a courtroom? And without that, the daughter or the child probably can't bring the lawsuit without the support of the, of the mom. Wow, really fascinating. Um, I'll, I'll bring in our panelists to react to react as well, because I'm sure many at home might be feeling similarly. Jennifer, I, 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 this is heartbreaking, right? Because no one really wins in this situation. Yeah, Emma, this is a really tragic case. And, and look, there are four tenets of bioethics, and one of those is non-malfeasance to, to not do ill. Uh, to the patient, and in this case, the, the patient's daughter. Uh, this is really tragic. I don't know if we need, uh, you know, more legislation uh, to curb things like this or just a, a stronger code of ethics in the bioethics. Uh, and look, and not to take a sharp right turn here, but this is what happens when we walk into this brave new world uh, many, many years ago of, you know, uh, in vitro fertilization instead of traditional home values where a man and a woman, you know, create a child uh, naturally. Uh, so there's certainly a Pandora's box here that's open to this. And, and the fact that the attorney here has so many of these cases goes to show what a crisis we're facing. Uh, and again, for, for couples who aren't able to conceive naturally and who would be looking for alternative outlets uh, to become pregnant through in vitro or, or through sperm donors as well. Jack Kingston, Jennifer posed the question, could there be anything done from a political standpoint uh, to, to make sure that this wouldn't happen? I know it would typically come down to uh, the ethics of the doctor, but, you know, could Congress step in? Uh, Congress absolutely could step in, as could state governments. As I understand it, and Hunter knows best, but there are about 500 of these clinics nationwide and about 1,000 lawsuits of one sort or the other. 
they are self-regulated. They are self-regulated through the Society of Assisted Reproductive Technology. And so sometimes self-regulation is a very good thing, but sometimes it goes awry. And I think with so many cases, people like Hunter might uh, propose what changes should should we make? And and I'm not one. To, let's go out and create a new oversight committee and federal government regulation. But I think, um, as he said, the cases are rising and people are using these clinics. They do play a valuable role, but there should be some sort of oversight if self-regulation isn't working. Yeah, we'll wait and see uh, if there could be anything like that coming through. Uh, Hunter Skolnick joining us live on the program. Thank you very much. And our panelists, Thank Jack so Kingston, much. Jennifer Kearns, please stick around.